And he literally said to my face, he said, you'll never make money helping people that don't have money. Mm. I was like, okay. And I left. I literally quit. And, and so this is why I feel like it was the right time because he wouldn't, he would have never supported those goals of mine. And yeah. I feel like there's enough people, right? My, my thing was like, I'm looking at the numbers, right? We're going after the top 1% to manage their money. That gives me 99% of the world that yeah. I can, that's my target market. And that felt like a, a good enough number. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the More Rounds Podcast. I'm Kim Lewis, CEO and co-founder of Chromix. And today, you guys, we're going to be talking about how to fund your business, whether that's cash flow, debt, or investment. And with me today, I have none other than Dominique Broadway, financial coach extraordinaire. But before we get into Dominique's story, I want to make sure we do our toast. Yes. All right. Let's grab this. Quick little cheers. Cheers. Yay. Mm. We not down in it? Girl, <laughs> what kind of party is this? <laughs> now go ahead, Janet. No, I'm making these questions up in I don't really do white wine, but you know, for you, I'll, I'll do it. Girl, I had a Zinfandel for you. You know, we could have done a little salad. It's though. cool. It's cool. Next time, next time. Okay. <laughs> Dominique, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your story, how you got started, and then we'll get into funding your business later. Yeah. So, um, Dominique Broadway, I'm a award winning financial planner, personal finance expert, and the CEO of Finances Demystified. I got started technically like when I was 16, right? So when I was 16, I started, started teaching myself how to trade and invest um, and just got really, really obsessed with learning ways to make my money work for me. I realized really early on that exchanging hours for dollars, dollars for hours, it wasn't gonna work. <laughs> I was like, mm. you know, I remember working like, you know, you're a teenager, you're working like odd jobs, like, you know, um, I worked at like picture people. You remember picture people? Like picture people. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I worked at a magic photo studio before. Yeah, like developing. Um, Wait, pictures. you know how to take the baby? Um, do you know how to like get kids to smile? No, I, I didn't. I ain't never got promoted to that. I ain't last that long. I was just in the back, girl. Okay. <laughs> so I have a I have a thing. Like okay. you have to do. Brrr. Oh, okay, I've seen them do that with my children. Yeah, yes, that okay. is the thing. But anyway, it never mind. Sense. I thought you was down. You're not down. Yeah, okay, no, I, no, girl, I just I, I didn't stay there long enough to get to get get to that point. Uh, you know, working like Old Navy, um, Target, and stuff like that. And back then, you know, an hour you were getting paid like five seventy five, right? Five dollars seventy five cents, something like that. And I was just like, look, this can't be like everything. I have to figure out how to make more money. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd already started like little small businesses, you know, selling bracelets and, um, also became the C the COO of one of my friends companies called kids interactive data systems. And we taught children how to use computers in the evenings and weekends. So I was really like en engrossed you in like everything. Yeah. I was engrossed in the business world. I love business as a teenager. Um, and so I remember going to my mom, like, well, how, like, how are rich people getting rich? Like this, cause this, this 575 ain't going, it ain't gonna get me there and I realized it was really three ways right so the stock market uh real estate and entrepreneurship those were like the three ways that the richest people in the world obtain their wealth I'd already de already dabbled in a um entrepreneurship I ain't have enough money to buy no house uh but I was like okay let me understand this investing stuff so I went to my family I was like yo how do we do this and they're like I'm gonna be honest we don't really know the ins and outs of how to do it. We have some investment accounts, but I couldn't tell you what they mean. So I just literally started digging in with no YouTube back then, um, going to the library, reading magazines, and just started to learn how to invest. And my first two investments were, I had like 50 bucks. Um, I put $25 into Apple and then $25 into Jones Soda. Do you remember Jones Soda? Girl, okay. no. What no. is on soda? It was so good. It was like they're still around. So the stock, the stock is trash, but the drink is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. They had this green apple soda that I was like absolutely obsessed with, and they they used to do like weird flavors. Like for Thanksgiving, they would have like you know a Thanksgiving meal soda, like you know weird stuff. Um, but anyway, those are my first two investments, and I just continued to invest over time. You know, buying more shares of Apple, um, and then going to college. Do you still have that stock in Apple? Mm -hmm. Well, not that stock. No, I sold that stock. Oh, how much did um, you get to? When when Apple first got to like 110, I was elated, right? I was still in college. I had paid probably 20 bucks a share for it. Okay. And I, I sold it around. The stupidest decision ever, obviously. Oh, um, so you I, made like a few hundred bucks, basically. No, I had, no, no, no. I had a lot. I had like 
I had accumulated a lot. From What's 16, a lot? like at that time I had like 30, 40 K. Oh, okay. That yeah, I had been like saving and then I also started trading. So I started teaching myself how to trade. So mm-hmm. then I was multiplying my money. So I was doing that while I was in college and working. I also was working, um, running promotions for like Starbucks and stuff like that. Right. I did that. I always loved marketing. So that's what do you mean running promotions for Starbucks. So experiential marketing events. So okay. we did experts. Like when, you know, if you're like at a festival or something and you see like a big Starbucks truck out there and they're giving out, um, Samples of the Starbucks, like I was doing stuff like that. Um, you but, was hustling, you know. Yeah, a lot of stuff. but I was the but I was the manager though, right? So I was I had to drive the big old Starbucks van, <laughs> um, and I would just manage all the other employees. And then it was cool. That was a remote job because I would get to go back home, do all of my, I mean, back to my college dorm, do all of my reports and stuff like that. So I was clocking hours. Like I, my family didn't know, but I was working like sometimes 40, 50 hours a week. Wow, but. I was also working some of them from home because I got to you know do a lot of the reporting from home. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was working jobs. I was investing. Um, I went to Bowie State University, which is a historically black college, majored in banking and finance, um, and then got an internship at um, UBS Financial Services. And uh, that was really like the starting point for me in the investment space. And you know, when I first started out, what was your major? Banking and finance. Oh, that was because of banking finance was your major in mm-hmm. college. Yeah, they, okay. Well, it was called banking and finance. But I yeah. just never heard of it called banking. Yeah, they don't do it HBCUs. Anymore? You know, they used to be making up stuff, but I don't know. <laughs> I was like, Look, if you I, run an HBCU, I didn't say that she I did. Know, okay, they do. y'all know HBCU. Y'all be they making up degrees and majors and stuff. It was called bank. It was a banking. I was a banking and finance major. They made it very clear <laughs> that's what I, what I was. Um, and so I. Um, you know, like I said, during this time, I'm, I'm still investing. Uh, and I realized I wanted to get into this field. I'm like, I want to be a stockbroker. Okay. Right? And my, you know, a lot, my family like, okay, what's stockbroker? Like, what is this? And I was started looking for women, right? Black women specifically. I'm like, where are the other black <laughs> women that are stockbrokers? And it was like, you know, needle in a haystack. Um, I found two people, Melody Hobson and um, Carla Harris. Uh, and Melody Hobson, she was, I don't know, I think she was, uh, I think she was at her own firm at that time. And uh, Carla Harris was at Morgan Stanley. So I set my sights like that's my dream job, Morgan Stanley. I ended up getting the job, the internship at Morgan Stanley. And then that the week and I'm supposed to move to New York, they cut the entire internship program. Um, and oh. I also totaled my car on the same day. So, you know, obviously, as someone in their young 20s, you feel like your whole world just came right. to an end. Right. It rains, it pours. Yes. And so um, UBS was like, all right, cool. We'll take you in. You know, you guys can come over here. I still had to interview, et cetera, et cetera. Got this job at UBS. Um, and it was really a game changer for me. I had never heard of UBS Financial Services, which, you know, obviously now it's, you know, They're it's, big it's always now, a yes. big, they've they always been a big deal. Now, but the yes. thing was they didn't market to me, right? Yeah. Because they were marketing to the ultra wealthy and high net worth individuals. Exactly. I was not a high net worth individuals. My family was like middle, upper middle class, middle class, but like we didn't have enough money to become clients there. You had to have millions and millions of dollars. And so they were never marketing to us. And I went in and realized like, whoa, you know, that's my first time ever seeing two commas. Um, and I was like, okay, goals like this is <laughs> this is this is what I want and um I just got really really you know like I said became a licensed financial planner um after I graduated college um worked at actually ended up working at UBS after that that's where I got licensed at and then were you making like a lot of money at UBS or not really yeah so not tons because I was new right and mm-hmm. so when you're I was new fresh out of college and I was still studying for my licenses so you can't trade until you're or you can't trade or place trades until you actually are licensed. So out of college, I was making maybe like fifty two thousand, right? Oh, that was okay. yeah, Wait, that was like yeah, I'm, that those was, I was starting to say a lot but more. Not how people think. People were like, "Ooh, you making you know a couple hundred thousand dollars?" And you yeah. can, you do, but it takes a long time to get there. Okay. And while you're studying, like that's really just kind of like your base pay. You're still you know you're working, but you're also studying. Um, no, obviously by the time I left, I was making way more than that, you know, yeah. over, over six figures for sure. Um, but it, I mean, that took time to, to get there. So the reason or how I got from there, to finance is demystified. Um, I had also bur- bought my first house when I was 22, before I graduated college. Um, it did take me an extra semester to graduate college, probably because I was working 20,000 jobs. Right. Um, I mean, you were driving, <laughs> driving the Starbucks Literally. truck, you was trading. Uh, yes. You was running I also your friend's was, business on the side. Yeah. You was doing lots of, yeah. It so was, was, an extra was, semester or two is understandable. Yeah, it took me a little extra semester. Um, I barely graduated. I had like a two point 
nine i think what you seriously did. yeah that is fun i mean you know, yeah. i ain't even mad at it these yeah. get degrees you know exactly so, you know, point, i hire all the 4.0 students I, they work for me now but no i um yeah i barely graduated <laughs> i was like just get me out i'm ready to- <laughs> <laughs> that's what you do you okay. Like, okay okay yeah. okay keep going keep going girl <laughs> okay so anyway um but i had bought my first house at 22 I, and my friends literally started coming to me like yo what what is what were you doing while we were in school that you know we weren't doing? They I graduated, moved to this uh, high rise condo in North Bethesda, Maryland, and they all went home with their parents. And I was like, yo, I've been investing and making my money and investing it and growing it. Have y'all been doing? I thought everybody was saving. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, no. And we have a crap ton of student loans and things like and this, that. At the time, this is something you could have done online, right? I was doing online. Okay, I just want to mm-hmm. make sure because I yeah. just I wasn't. I yeah, wasn't I was doing, doing online because you know at that you know I didn't have I wasn't licensed then when I first started I was sixteen so my first brokerage account was oh gosh it's like uh, ING it was like ING Direct they had their own and then they actually got acquired by like Capital One then it was like Capital One Investing and I also used E Trade so those are the things I was mainly E Trade the most when I was in college um, but yeah people it was like yo how are you doing this like how are you investing and I realized that there was this huge gap right. It was like literally, you know, during the day, um, working with high net worth individuals, they could be um, entrepreneurs, uh, politicians, um, NFL players, NBA players, you know, in where that office was located, it was just money all around it. Right. Mm. And I realized that, you know, as financial advisors, we're literally banging down the doors of rich people trying to trying to get them to let us manage their money. Yeah. And then if you don't have money, which is what, you know, or tons of money, which is what I was saying, it was like crickets. No one wanted to help you. And they like, well, call me when you get some money and then, <laughs> and then we'll help you. And so I'm like, wait a minute. What about these people that they need access to this information, access to um, some of these investment opportunities that, right. you know, and so that's, I literally quit my job. And um, I was actually at the time I was working at my mentor's firm. It was like the perfect setup, right? Um, I was working at my mentor's firm. I came into his firm specifically to take it over, right? Mm. So you know he was already he making like you in kind of yep. thing. Yep. Mm. Well, he owned the yeah he owned the company. He said, "Cool, come in. Like you're gonna learn everything. I'm gonna retire in like four or five years, and then you will run it, right?" Wow. And he was making probably like three four million a year. Um, and I was like, I was, it was a perfect position, but I kept getting this feeling. I'm just like, every day people are calling me like, help me with this. Or I'm trying to figure out my credit cards. And I'm just like, this is crazy. Right. I know you've made a lot of money. Yeah. Do you wish yeah. you had stayed there longer? No, no, no. Why not? I'm gonna tell you why. Because when I left, I, I told him why I was leaving. I said, I don't know. And I told him, I said, I don't know what it is. I really had no clue what I was going to do. I was like, but I'm supposed to be doing something else, something bigger. And I was like, I don't know what it is. And I was like, I think it may be something helping these people. And he literally said to my face, he said, you'll never make money helping people that don't have money. Mm. I was like, okay. And I left. I literally quit. And, And so this is why I feel like it was the right time because he wouldn't, he would have never supported those goals of mine. And I feel like there's enough people, right? My, my thing was like, I'm looking at the numbers, right? We're going after the top 1% to manage their money. That gives me 99% of the world that I can, that's my target market. And that felt like a a good enough number that I could educate. So, um, I think everything happens when it's supposed to happen. You know, I don't, I don't do a lot of the regrets and things like that. I think that every single thing that happens is, how it's supposed to happen and you know it's up to us to make the right decisions to push ourselves forward but no I I definitely don't regret that um how long did it take you to make what you were making at that job as an entrepreneur when you started financial advising um, you were financial advising yeah I was really just doing financial coaching right it was really truly just financial coaching I ended up giving up all my licenses um because you had to be at a firm to to place your licenses Uh, and that for me was for a while was a a mental struggle because I'm like, oh my God, I ain't trying to, you know, I, those series seven tests is very hard. Okay. You study for months and months and months. It is a seven hour exam, mm. three and a half hours on the first part, three and a half hours on the second part. It took me three times to pass this exam. Okay. Also okay. Okay. ADHD. Okay. So I'm like, oh my god no y'all okay so um most boring people got something you know yeah i'm like i cannot sit still so um yeah so it was really hard for me to give up those licenses and uh mentally and i you know ended up doing so and i it was it was the right decision because i felt like i felt like i needed to help all these people but it took me probably 
<sighs> oh, to make that's uh, two, two, maybe two and a half years. Okay. That's not yeah. bad at all. That's not I would say all. probably two and a half years, but I went broke. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I went like dead broke. Like how broke? Like car repossessed, house and foreclosure broke. Like broke, okay. broke, broke. That's kind of broke. broke. Yeah. You know, it's a little broke. We were, we, um, uh, <laughs> so the broken I got was we were counting our groceries down to the cents. Yeah. Like we had $73 and not a dollar more to spend on groceries. And so I don't know if that's like car repossessed, mortgage broke. Yeah. But like it's that's, like, that's like ramen noodle broke. You know? I can't even remember the food situation. I don't know. But, and it was also just me, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was I was a single woman, so you know I can whip up something or go to my mama's house or something like that. But um, yeah, so I started this company, and I had going, but also talking about like the funding. I had about at this time probably I was twenty six, I think, and I yeah. had maybe about fifty about fifty sixty thousand dollars saved. So I felt comfortable. Okay, right? I was like, I got money. Like you know, what I'm saying my bills is low. My little condo, I only paid one hundred and eighty six thousand dollars for it. So my mortgage all in with condo fee was like two thousand dollars. So I was like, my bills are you know manageable. I had bought a BMW because you know that's what you do when you trying to be fancy and that, but everything felt affordable. Yeah, and um, I. Ended up, you know, starting the company. And I know, I know all the reasons why I went broke. Right. And I'll share them. So it doesn't happen to someone else. Um, the reason why I went broke was because I was not charging enough. Mm, okay. And I was, I didn't have a true marketing plan and I didn't have a true just plan in general. Okay. Right. So I ended up starting, I'm, I'm, I um, ended up starting my company. I was literally driving never forget I was driving down the street and then on the radio they're like for sisters only next weekend make sure y'all come like you know so I'm like oh my god I'll go to for sisters only every year and then light bulb I was like oh I should get a booth at for sisters only Mm. it's my target audience yeah so I call the radio station like hey I'm trying to get a booth they're like all right we're gonna fax you this form we're gonna email you this form fax you this form fact it was a fax it was that that was there right right right. um and so i never forget i was feeling it out and i was telling my mom like i'm getting this booth it's a thousand dollars i'm also internally freaking out because a thousand dollars did seem like a lot of money for a booth i still feel like they took advantage of me but anyway look these booths are places all these ex-booths taking advantage okay i'm like and this was a long time ago i'm like two thousand dollar booths literally um and it was just a table and you know it anyway it should have been more anyway and i was feeling it i never forget my mom was like Girl, you got to be careful. They just going to steal your credit card information, right? So that's also <laughs> another lesson where a lot of times my, my mom has been my biggest supporter, but a lot of times her fear, you know, she doesn't want things to happen to me. You could, that can delay a lot of your blessings sometimes if you let other people put their fears on you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so anyway, I filled out the form, got it in, blah, blah, blah. Ended up getting the, you know, having the booth. I got about... 98 people to sign up for my email list is how I started building my email list. Um, I ended up making about a third of them clients. Oh, wow. Which was pretty substantial, right? And that also showed me how many people actually needed help. Um, And I was probably, I was charging maybe like 45, 50 bucks an hour, something like that. And then started creating packages and still not just charging enough. Yeah. Um, But I was busy. I was booked and busy. I had tons of clients and my clients were winning. Okay. Buying their first house, buying investment property, starting to invest, um, being more prepared for their first child. And, you know, most of my, all, actually all of my clients were black women or black families. And it was just so beautiful for me to see these people who felt like, certain dreams they weren't never going to be able to accomplish. And I was like showing them how to accomplish them behind the scenes. I am going broke, which is so Mm. weird. So this is a mental struggle for me because one, I've always been good with money Two, I'm a financial coach three, like, what the hell? I've always been good with money. So I'm just like, what am I doing? <laughs> One is three and three, and three yeah, is two. It's and two. It's like, like it, just, it ain't adding up. And that's, and, like, that's got to be a really, my, I, you know, the, the word I would say if I wasn't trying to cuss be the mind. Yeah. You know, yes, like, it was. Like, it was the biggest issue. And then be like, hey, I'm actually going broke. I it, actually don't have money. How can I coach you and tell you what to do? But the knowledge and the practice are very different. It things. is. And it was literally something I could not process. As you said, it was just messing my brain up. And I started to feel like a hypocrite, like a, like a, like a hypocrite, like a hypocrite. I'm like, I'm telling these people what to do, but I am starting to drown financially. And then I started ignoring my financial situation, which a lot of us do. I'm like, okay, next month I'll just get more clients next month. And then it never happened. Right. And if it did, I was already too far behind. So what'd you do Um, to fix that? So what I did was, um, I never forget. I got, I got a letter in the, uh, served papers on my condo association was suing me. 
I was like, all right, this is this is. This How is, long did you go without paying your mortgage? Uh, without paying a mortgage, I don't know long enough for them to start foreclosing on it. It's like three it's months. Long time. No, I take like take a long time to foreclose, like six months. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, about six. They take it takes a while. They don't foreclose quick. But yeah. So what, what t- turned it around was literally one day, and this is also why I created this book, The Wealth Decision. Was I literally just made a decision one day? I was like, this ain't it. You know what I mean? I was literally like, this is not it. Like, I'm only going to make wealth decisions going forward. And I could tell I was making just these broke-ass decisions. Like, I was making broke people decisions. What's a broke decision? Uh, Ignoring your finances. (laughs) (laughs) Ignoring your finances. Literally not opening your mail. Like, I was doing things, like, not charging enough. Not Like, I was literally doing things that keep you broke. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, And so, I went to my mom and was like, yo, I got to... I just, we were sitting in her car, I just busted out crying. She's like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, oh my God, I'm so broke. I'm going to be homeless. I'm like, oh. Now, obviously, my mom is like, oh. but that's how you feel, right? And everyone's suing me and blah, blah, blah. She's like, girl, just calm down. And she started sharing with me, like, financial issues that she's had. And I'm like, why y'all ain't never tell me that people have gone through this? And the biggest thing, the reason why it took me so long to ask for help is because I didn't want to let my family down. I felt mm. like I, they had invested so much time, money, and energy into yeah. me, and I didn't want to be a letdown. And so, then I went to my grandfather and I was like, look, Papa, I need you to uh, treat me like I'm a like I'm a client. Right. And I said, <laughs> I'm going to come over and I'm going to bring all my papers. So I came to his house. We sat at the kitchen table. I brought all the mail. None of it had been opened. OK, mm. all the mail. And we sat one by one and just started opening the mail and writing out what my debt was, how much my income was. I just needed someone else to do what I did for others to me because I just couldn't do it for myself because I was scared to face the fact that I had got myself into this situation mm. and we, even a therapist needs a therapist yeah literally and so I ended up um from there like we just started calling debt collectors one by one negotiating and I determined like okay this is how much I need to uh set aside each month working out payment plans with all of them and literally gradually over time starting to get myself out of it now the big thing that got me out of it is something that I know entrepreneurs never want to do I what? got a BJ, right? Which is a bridge job. Mm. Now mine's probably went somewhere else. But yes, I got a bridge job. Okay. Because I was like, I need some more money. Like yeah. I can work with these clients, but I need consistent money. What's going to give me peace of mind is knowing that this paycheck's going to come every single month. I was actually here in Atlanta at an event and we were doing, it was a, a Goody Nation event. It was like a hackathon thing. And we were hacking like how to fix something. And we were talking about finance. And we had presented, and I think our group ended up winning. At the end, this lady comes up to me, and she's like, um, hey, I have this nonprofit, um, but I live in Maryland. I'm not sure if you live here. And, you know, I would love to see if we can work together. You know, it's in the personal finance space. And I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, where do you live? And she's like, uh, Falls, Great Falls. I'm like, I live 10 minutes from Great Falls. She's like, no way. So we get back to Maryland. We meet. And this lady is just like an older white lady, just super, super rich, big old house, has this nonprofit that she's super passionate about. We're born on the same day. Crazy. Um, And I become the um, basic executive director of her nonprofit. Mm. And she wasn't paying me tons. It was like $3,000 a month um, because she didn't have a huge budget. But it was all I really needed, right, to to have that piece of mind. To cover that baseline, yeah. And so that really is what turned helped to turn things around for me. Um, and I was, I didn't lose my house. I ended up working out a plan to, cause my mom actually used to own a company that helped people who were behind on their mortgage. So thank God she helped me to negotiate, to keep the house. That's how you knew you can go six months without paying yeah. your mortgage. I'd be too <laughs> oh, scared. I'd be like, mm, oh, they yeah, me I out. know Bay girl call my mom based on the state. She's like, yeah, you got three, four, me three months. You good. Um, and so I ended up getting my house out of foreclosure, working on a plan to retain it. Um, had to end up negotiating with the condo association cause they were suing me. And then, um, Got my car up back as well. Um, they had repossessed the car, uh, and then I was able to get it back actually at a lower price. So that was like kind of like the broke story. Then from there, it was it was all up from there. I ain't gonna mm. lie. It, it has been up. It has been a, a riding a uphill uphill battle. Uphill battle. 
it's always battles, but still. But now um, you're kind of riding the roller coaster almost. Like it's like you just up, up, you know, like yeah. you were down. You haven't been as down as you were then no. before. Gotcha. No, okay. no. So what are some no. of the things that have happened uh-huh. since then? Like I know you nah. have financial education, but like, yeah. what, so what is demystifying finances like? Tell me about that. Yeah. So when we first started, it was literally just financial coaching, right? Finances demystified. It just literally only provided financial coaching and um, events. I used to do financial events. Mm-hmm. And I know, um, you know, obviously you talk about funding. I have never raised any money. Okay. But I did win one competition, right? Oh, okay. And I, was, Tell me about and I actually forgot about it. And I was coming here today. I was like, oh, I totally forgot. So I was the person that applied for everything, right? I applied for everything when I first started. Any, I feel like it wasn't as many programs as there are now, especially for black women, but I applied for everything. There was this program called Elevate by Fairfield. Okay. And they selected a, a group of women and basically was like, you get acts, they gave you like a small stipend, like maybe $2,000 or something like that. And then you get access to all of the Fairfields in the country to do whatever you want to do with them, like hmm. for events or whatever, whatever. It was like a really interesting comp- who, competition and whoever using the most creatively or had the most impact with them got, won this money. Um, and the, the money was tw- like, tw- I think it was $25,000. Okay. And uh, what was it like that? I don't know, it's been a long time. That sounds like yeah, a lot. It was good. It was yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. And so I um, ended up winning. Um, and I used it. It was cool because I was hosting financial events around the DC area, just called finances to mystified happy hours to provoke the conversation of money and alcohol and, and drinks. You get some alcohol, people will start talking about their money and yes. we were having big breakthroughs, you know, doing that. And so I would do it at a lot of their different facilities. I also uh, like, okay. So, th- so this yeah. is a way to fund your business. Yeah. This is a way to like. You want a competition, you want 2025K yep. there, we're able to do these financial events, build community. And honestly, that's how you were building brand equity and you were building mm, like your credibility. 10, might have been 10K now, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, but yeah, it was we'll pay, good. Yeah. But, <laughs> but this is what I'm saying too, because I think people don't realize like black founders, because we don't get checks like that, we end up doing super creative things to we fund our business. Creative. Yes. And so competitions is a great way to fund your business. Yeah. I mean, okay. I hosted events in New York, Baltimore. I was using them Fairfield facilities. Yeah. All right. So I got a couple of uh, questions I want to okay. ask. Oh, here it is. I got my phone. Okay, so this is called the lightning round. Lightning. Okay, <laughs> so I got a few questions for you, Dominique. Okay. Let, me, let me pull them up on my notes. What's a belief that you once had that you no longer have about entrepreneurship? Mm. And you can't say it's easy, that you thought it was yeah. going to be easy, because everybody says that. I would say the belief that I had is that once you make your first million, that everything will be fine. That's something I, I thought was the case. And that's not the case. Mm, that's why not is the not case the case? Well, as you know, more money, more problems. <laughs> um, I know. You know, even your first million is different than your second million. And even when I hit eight figures, it was totally more complex than seven figures. And uh, right. Ended up, I probably ended up being more stressed with money than I was without. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a lot of responsibility. It's okay. a lot of responsibility. That's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, most embarrassing moment as an entrepreneur. Most embarrassing moment. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Quick question. It's a vulnerable one. I, mean, I know, honestly, I know something came to mind, but you're like, I, I, no, I, that can't even, I really can't think as an entrepreneur. Embarrassing. I don't know. I mean, every day you're really putting yourself out there to be judged. I can't think of an embarrassing moment. That's true. Yeah, I don't even know. All right, all right, all right. Um, what mistake did you make that you wish you could go back and change? The biggest mistake I honestly feel like I made was not believing in myself and in the value that I brung earlier. Mm. That's also one of the reasons that I was, as I was saying earlier, that I did get into go into financial ru- ruin is that I didn't truly understand the value that I was providing for people's lives. You know, something that I was charging 50, 60 bucks for someone else, a counterpart that maybe does not look like me was charging thousands of dollars for. Mm. And so I really wish that I knew my value earlier on. Okay. That was good. Um, most money you ever lost on a deal. I'm in it right now. I can't even talk about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, I, ooh, that was a tough, that was oh, a, a man. soft spot. It's a couple. It's, is a, uh, I, I would say, about yeah, it. last year I did an acquisition and it, a few, few hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, but okay. I'm about to get some back, so. Okay, okay. I mean, look, you got to lose money to make some, yeah. you know, you, it, it's less than the losses. I'm still mad about it, though. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Next episode. <laughs> Next episode. <laughs> um, moment that you want to relive in entrepreneurship that you were like, this is an amazing moment. Yes. Totally do that again. The moment I would like to relive 
is the moment when I had my first million dollar month. Mm. It was really cool. And I didn't even know it had happened. Um, and I, I was sitting in bed a Friday night, just reviewing my finances. Like I normally do. Cause I'm a finance nerd. And I was like, you know, looking at the past 30 days and I was like, Whoa, Whoa, I made a million dollars. And I had no clue because I had set the goal to do it. And I just couldn't believe that I had done it. And I just sat there. Like, it wasn't even like, a, it was just like, <laughs> right because you know i felt like a lot of times like you don't know, remember that show who wants to be a millionaire it was mm-hmm. like that's that's good tim that's was the, on it i remember oh really oh like mm-hmm. that's the easy did he win a lot. He won a hundred thousand okay. dollars i signed him up when okay. we were like okay. 21 years old yeah that was a goal of mine i wanted to be on that show so bad um, not too late yeah is, is this is it back on they keep re- renewing it and coming uh, back on looking for no, hosts and there's nothing yeah the answers but yeah but anyway i always wanted to be on it but no that that's a moment that i would love to relive which i probably couldn't because it's past but um as far as like that that instant but you know hey i would i could do 10 million in a month or something that'd be cute or something right <laughs> that would be a that would be a life goal okay yeah last question uh-huh. and this is a layup okay what's a book that everyone should read right girl i'm like don't you think about it. you don't pick up that book and <laughs> but but show everybody I, I, what I the book to, is i had to fake think about so the wealth decision definitely a book that you should read we've hit some awesome bestseller lists and it's just an absolutely amazing book about all the bad decisions that i made and how you can learn from them and really just those 10 simple steps to achieve financial freedom. Like, honestly, we are getting such amazing for reviews from all across the world of people like, yo, this book is literally changing my life. And it's, it's the most like non BS financial book that's out there. Right. It's like, yeah. this is how I messed up. This is how I fixed it. And you know, a lot of financial books are like, I've always been perfect. And I came out the womb perfect. And yeah. I, you know, yeah, so yeah, yeah, that, yeah. this is the wealth decision uh, at one. target, Barnes and Nobles, all your favorite stores, Amazon, everywhere, audible, you can grab it. Yes, we love it. <laughs> Dominique, thank you so much for coming thank on the show. And thank you guys for tuning into the More Rounds podcast. I'll see you guys on the next episode.